I heard about a preacher who studied John 3.16 for all of his whole ministry and intensely studied it so that when he was about to retire, he had produced 600 unique outlines on John 3.16. No verse of scripture has been explained as much as John 3.16, and there is no verse of scripture that defies explanation as does that verse. I've noticed that a lot of times when young men begin to start preaching, they grab hold of John 3.16 and they preach it a lot. But if you've been preaching for very long, you discover that's not what you do. G. Campbell Morgan said that this was a verse of scripture he had never attempted to preach on in all the years of his great preaching. He said, I've gone around it and around it, but it has always been too big for me to tackle. When I read it, there's nothing else to say. If we only knew how to read it, we would produce a sense in the ears of our people so that there would be nothing left to preach about. (laughs) And I need to confess that I think it was about at the 15 year mark when I started preaching, I preached on John 3.16 for the first time. I remember thinking, what in the world would I say about this verse? I mean, it's so simple and everybody knows it by heart. What am I going to add to this truth? And then it was almost as if God was reminding me that my job is not to come up with something great and cute and creative, but my job is to stand up and repeat the simple truth once again so that everyone hears it and understands it. Whenever you hear the story of God's love, it strikes a resounding note in your heart because there's something that's in each of us It's the fact that we've been created in the image of God. There's something that's in each of us that somehow, maybe it's in the distant recesses of our mind, but we know that God loves us. Then when somebody preaches it, it strikes fire with this intuitive thing that God has put within us. Our lives are divided into days, our days into moments. And sometimes a moment is all it takes for God to encourage us, meet us in our deepest need, and strengthen us to face the day. What will your next moment with God bring you? In Moments with God, Dr. David Jeremiah has crafted 365 thoughts designed to encourage powerful daily moments between you and the Lord. This beautiful soft leather devotional features 365 daily devotions that include scripture readings and biblical insights from Dr. Jeremiah to help you grow each day, an ideal companion to your Bible study. The Moments with God 365 day devotional can be yours for a gift of any amount. This devotional is also perfect for sharing with others. And with a generous gift of $120 or more in support of this program, you'll receive a four pack of Moments with God. Find the perfect moment to share Jesus with someone you know. Thank you for your support of the Ministry of Turning Point. Request Moments with God today. Somebody once told me that it was a truth so simple it didn't need to be written about. And I said, no, it's a truth so profound, I don't feel worthy to write about it. You know, a lot of people are really confused about God's love. He doesn't love the way we do. We love others because of what they do for us. He loves us because it's his nature to love. And when you know the love of God, it's the most amazing thing. I was looking for a way to help people simply understand God's love. The love of God is like a universe you've never been to before, and when you try to understand it from God's perspective, you know, we're not equipped to do that. And what I've tried to do, and God loves you, He always has and He always will, is to echo the heart of God to the people of the world. The interesting thing about knowing God is to realize that God has always loved us and it's just the most wonderful thing when we discover that because then we can start loving him back. The Bible actually says God is love. When you know that, you know, when you know somebody loves you, when you know God loves you, it makes all the difference. Connect with Turning Point on the go, anytime, anywhere. 
Download the newly redesigned Turning Point app to listen to Turning Point Radio, watch Turning Point Television, read daily devotionals, and more. Plus, for the young ones in your life, the new Airship Genesis Pathway to Jesus mobile game, an engaging narrative puzzle adventure game that explores the life of Jesus. Available now on the App Store. If you watch sporting events on television, you've seen John 3.16. In the NFL games, in the NBA games, people write that verse on a card and they sit in the end zone and they hold it up so you can see John 3.16. I'm sure a lot of folks wonder what that is. Because if you don't know God, if you're not a Christian, you wouldn't have a clue what that means. John 3.16, as many of you know, is the favorite verse of Tim Tebow. In fact, when he was a collegiate quarterback, he used to wear that verse in the eye black over his eye. He have, he'd have it, John 3, 16, in the eye black over his eye. Strange thing happened to Tim Tebow after the Denver Broncos playoff victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers. It was discovered that his passing yardage in that historic game was 316 yards. The Associated Press reported that he also averaged 31.6 yards per completion. And not everyone understood what this was all about. The religious connotation of John 3.16 escaped them. And so on Monday morning, John 3.16 was the most searched term on Google. (laughs) And this was not the first time such a thing had happened with Tebow when he wore the scripture verse on his eye black during the National Collegiate Championship game the college game in 2009, the term John 316 was reportedly Googled more than 90 million times. What an incredible way to get people to look up John 316. (laughs) Tebow has said this verse is his favorite, and everywhere he goes, he finds some way to share it. John 316 is the most famous verse in the Bible, and it is the gist of the whole Bible wrapped up in just 25 words. If all the Bible were to be lost or destroyed, except for John 3.16, there would be more than enough information for the entire world to be converted. John 3.16 tells us more about God and his plan for this world than any other scripture to which you could turn. I heard about a preacher who studied John 3.16 for all of his whole ministry, and intensely studied it so that when he was about to retire, he had produced 600 unique outlines on John 3.16. No verse of scripture has been explained as much as John 3.16, and there is no verse of scripture that defies explanation as does that verse. I've noticed that a lot of times when young men begin to start preaching, they grab hold of John 3.16 and they preach it a lot. But if you've been preaching for very long, you discover that's not what you do. G. Campbell Morgan said that this was a verse of scripture he had never attempted to preach on in all the years of his great preaching. He said, I've gone around it and around it, but it has always been too big for me to tackle. When I read it, there's nothing else to say. If we only knew how to read it, we would produce a sense in the ears of our people so that there would be nothing left to preach about. (laughs) And I need to confess that I think it was about at the 15-year mark when I started preaching, I preached on John 3.16 for the first time. I remember thinking, what in the world would I say about this verse? I mean, it's so simple and everybody knows it by heart. What am I going to add to this truth? And then it was almost as if God was reminding me that my job is not to come up with something great and cute and creative, but my job is to stand up and repeat the simple truth once again, so that everyone hears it and understands it. Whenever you hear the story of God's love, it strikes a resounding note in your heart because there's something that's in each of us. It's the fact that we've been created in the image of God. There's something that's in each of us that somehow, maybe it's in the distant recesses of our mind, but we know that God loves us. Then when somebody preaches it, it strikes fire with this intuitive thing that God has put within us. So here from one verse in the Gospel of John, the most famous verse in the Bible are seven incredible truths about God's love. Number one, God's love is extravagant. 
For God so loved the world. When John wrote these words, God was considered to be a tyrant driving men to hell. Even today, heathen religions try to satisfy their gods. Medicine men and witch doctors go through all kinds of incantations in their attempt to placate God. In their minds, God is an angry God who's waiting to punish all mankind, and you got to do something to talk him out of it. And against that backdrop is John 3.16, which astounds us and reminds us that God is not a tyrant, but God is a God of pure and holy love. And the message of the Bible is not that man can satisfy God, but that Jesus Christ has satisfied God in our behalf, and we can put our trust in him. The most significant word in John 3.16 is the little word, so. For God so loved the world. In that word are all the agonies of the cross, all the suffering that Jesus experienced while he was on earth. God loved us, and he loved us in a special way. He so loved us that he did something about that love. How did God love us? He so loved us. It's like you, you go to somebody that you love today, and you say, I love you. I, I love you so much. Years ago, Don and I had the opportunity to visit London, England for the very first time. And some of the great churches in that city were our determination to visit. And we visited St. Paul's Cathedral, and as we left the cathedral that day, in the annex of the cathedral, there was a huge statue of Jesus Christ writhing in anguish on the cross. The look of pain was on his face, and the drops of blood on his body. And underneath that statue was a plaque that said this, this is how God loved the world. This is how God loved the world. God did not just say, I love you. God said, I love you, and then he did something to prove that he loves us. As he hung on the cross, writhing in agony, God was writing his message of love to us in red. He knew that we were doomed and damned to death because of our sin, and he sent Jesus Christ, and Christ suffered, and he demonstrated the Father's love for you and me. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. God's love is extravagant, my friends. God did not just say, I love you, but God said, I so love you. And then he did something to prove it. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is extravagant. And God's love is extensive. For God so loved the world. <laughs> the apostle John is known as the apostle of love. He's the one who called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. How incredible is it to discover that the first time John ever uses the word agape, the New Testament word for love, is right here in John 3.16. He would go on to use that word 35 more times in his gospel, 31 more times in 1 John, a total of 57 times in just the gospel and in 1 John. But here in John 3.16, he uses it for the first time. And we're taught to believe that the first use of the word in the New Testament Greek language is to define the word for its use from that point on. So here we are told that God so loved the world. Had you and I been given opportunity to choose someone to love, we would not have chosen the world. I mean, the extraordinary thing is that such a thing would even come from the lips of a Jewish person. The ancient Hebrews were aristocrats in their day. They did not look at anyone with favor except on fellow Jews, and the Jewish person would look down with proud disdain on every Gentile. We've learned about that in our Bible studies. But here is Jesus, a Jew, declaring that God loves everyone. God loves the lovable and the unlovable. He loves those who know him and those who don't know him. He loves them from every tribe and nation in the entire globe. God loves the whole world. One of the reasons why we are so committed to missions at Shadow Mountain 
is because we believe God has called us to express his heart to the world. What is the heart of God? He loves the world. Missions is simply our way of taking the love of God in every possible, imaginable way we can come up with and sharing that with everyone in every corner of the globe through radio and television and individual missionaries and through the streaming of our services and through books and every way you can think, every imaginable way. What we want to do is we want to stand on the mountaintop and shout, God loves you. He always has and he always will. That is a message for the whole world. If there's anybody in this whole world that does not fit this this statement of God's love, then the Bible cannot be true. You may know somebody you think is terrible. You may think, oh, that person, God couldn't love him because God could not love a Hitler or a Stalin or all these people that we know of. God loves the whole world. There's nobody that God does not love. His love is extensive. Now, we know that love is different in the ways that we describe it. For instance, I love the United States of America. I'm glad I was born here. I'm excited about being an American. Literally, uh, every time I hear somebody stand up, like when we go to our arena events around the country, we start the event, and Joy Bowling uh, comes, and she stands up, and, and they put a big flag on the screens behind her, and she sings, God Bless America, and she's not into the third the third uh, measure of that song before everyone's on their feet and they're cheering. When that happens, I, something happens in me as it does in you. I love America. But I have a grandson named Levi. And I love Levi. His little brother calls him Leviticus. I don't know why he does that, but his name is Levi. Now, For me to say that I love the United States the same way I love Levi would not be true. I love Levi with an emotion in my heart and an intensity in my heart that is not possible for anyone else, anything else. But when God says that he loves the whole world, it is possible for God to love the world and yet at the same time love every individual in the world in the same intimate, personal way that I love my grandson. When the Bible says that God loves the world, it does not differentiate between the two kinds of love I've expressed. God loves each individual in the world as if they were the only person in the world who needed to be loved. God's love is extensive. For God so loved the world. And thirdly, God's love is expensive. It's free to us, but it costs God everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's only begotten son means God's unique son. The word only begotten means unique. It means it's the only one God had. God only had one son, his unique, his only begotten son. The Bible says that Jesus is the image of God and he's the only begotten of the Father. And this is a love, according to John 3, 16, that God demonstrates to us by giving us the most expensive gift he could possibly give. There is nothing else God could have done that would have exceeded the expense of the gift of his own son. He looked around heaven and said, what shall I do? I need to send this message of love to my creatures. And he put his hand upon his son and said, this will I do. I will send you there to be my message. He sent his only begotten son into this world to pay the price of our sin and to demonstrate his love. Listen to 1 John 4, 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us in that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In other words, in this, God communicated his love to us. In this, his love is communicated to us, is shared with us. In this, he shares his love with us. And how does he do that? He sends his only begotten son into the world. Romans 8, 32 says it this way. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us 
all things. I love that little phrase. Almighty God spared not his own son. You know, here at Shadow Mountain, we've had a lot of wonderful moments in this building. I remember a lot of them, and I could give you maybe my top 10. <laughs> One moment I will never forget happened at a communion service. Someone had given me a little film clip, and I watched it, and I thought this would be a good way to introduce communion on Sunday and help people understand what it means when the Bible says that God loves us and gave Jesus Christ to be our Savior. It was a film clip, a story of a farming family that made a little money on the side by taking care of the drawbridge for a railway system. On certain days, the father would go to a small little shack, and there he would lower the drawbridge so that the train could pass over. On this particular day in the film, the father got to the little shack. He knew the train was on its way, and as he started to lower the bridge to his horror, he discovered that his little seven-year-old son had climbed up the ties, and he was clear at the top of the track. And if he lowered the bridge, he was lowering his son, and he would be right on the path of the oncoming train. The brief film showed the agony of the father as he realized that he was faced with the choice of lowering the bridge for the safety of hundreds of passengers on the train and in the process sacrificing his own son or failing to lower the bridge and sparing his own son. And the film right at that moment went black. And on the bottom of the screen it said, what would you do? And I don't know what I would do. I would hate to ever have been put in a spot like that. But I know what God did. The Bible says God did not spare his own son. He let the tracks come down so the train could go by, and you and I were on that train. We were on that train. God did not spare his own son, but he gave him up so that we might be saved. God's love is extravagant. God's love is extensive, and it's expensive. But God's love is also expansive. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever might be saved. Richard Baxter used to say that he was glad that God put the word whosoever in John 3, 16. He said, I'm glad he didn't put the word Richard Baxter in there. He said, if he had put Richard Baxter in there, I would be tempted to believe that he loves some other Richard Baxter, some Richard Baxter who was less sinful than I am. But when I read the word whosoever, I realize that it has to include me, for that word includes everybody. The Bible says that God loves the world, and because of that, whoever believes can receive his love. Each and every person, no matter who they are, where they come from, what language they speak, what color their skin is, what their background is, what they have done or haven't done, the Bible says God loves the whole world and he sent his son to be the savior of the whole world and whoever believes can be saved. It's a hard thing to get that across for some reason. I don't know why. Over the years, I've, I've tried every way to help people understand that whoever includes them. I remember uh, on occasion reading the scripture and, and putting people's name in it like this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if David Jeremiah would believe, he should not perish, but David Jeremiah could have everlasting life. That's true. But you can put anybody's name in there, anybody you know, anybody that you've heard of, anybody that you think might not even be a candidate for salvation. What this verse says is this, that if you're alive on planet Earth today, you are a candidate for God's love. For God so loved the world that whosoever, who, whosoever might be saved. Well, then you say, Pastor Jeremiah, why isn't everybody saved? Why isn't everybody a Christian? Why doesn't everybody have a free pass to heaven? 
Because you see, God's love is expansive, but it's also exclusive. Here's what I mean. Whosoever, what's the next word? Believes. Four times in these few verses, Jesus uses variations of the word believe, perhaps the most important key word in John's gospel. The love of God will prove useless to everyone who does not believe. You see, God can offer you his love, and he offers it to the whole world and to everyone. If there's any gospel that you have heard that doesn't work in any place in the world, it's not the Christian gospel. The Christian gospel is for the whole world, the third world, for our world, for any world. But listen, just because God offers you his love doesn't mean that you get his love. Because in order to get his love, you have to receive it. You have to reach out your hands and take it. If I offered everyone in this room, if I stood up here and said, I have uh, tickets to the Padres game, their next game at home, I have enough tickets for everyone in this room. All you got to do is come up and get it. That would be a genuine offer on my part, but it would only do you any good if you came up here and got your tickets and went to the game. God says, I love the whole world. I love whoever in the world. My love is available. Whoever believes will get my love. So some of you that come to church and you think by just coming to church and hearing about the love of God, that's all you need, then you're wrong. You go to hell knowing about the love of God. You go to heaven receiving the love of God. The love of God is God's plan of salvation for you, and if you will receive that plan, if you will believe it, if you will accept it, you will have it. But God isn't just going to force his love on you. God offers his love. His hands are wide open. The cross is a picture of his extended arms welcoming everyone to the shed blood of the cross. But my friends, you can't have what you don't receive. Listen to John 3:18, just a couple of verses ahead of one that we are talking about. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. While it is true, my friends, to say that God loves everyone, it is not true to say that everyone receives that love. Only those who believe receive. God's love is extravagant and extensive and expensive, and it's expansive and it's exclusive. Number six, it's exceptional. Whosoever believes will not perish. Now, let me straighten you out on that a little bit. Perish does not mean to be annihilated. Perish does not mean that you cease to exist. Every one of you here today will be alive somewhere forever. You know, some teach that when you die, that's it. You cease to exist. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we all live forever. And we're either going to be alive forever in heaven or we're going to be alive forever in hell. But we will be alive somewhere forever. Now the Bible says if we put our trust in Jesus Christ, if we believe that he came to this earth and he was God's love gift to us and he died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sin, if we put our trust in him and believe that, we will not perish. The word perish means to be separated from God forever. Sometimes it's referred to in the scripture as the second death. To be separated from God is far worse than all the pictures of of fire and brimstone you've ever seen about hell. To be separated from God is to be eternally locked in to your unquenchable thirst, your terrible passions, your appetites, your cravings, your inflamed desires, your fierce longings, your furious hates, your lusts, your white-hot temper, your spine-chilling fear. All of these things will have no relief and no satisfaction and no, no joy. The Bible says that when you go into eternity, As a lost person, you carry into eternity all of the unfulfillment of your life, and it's intensified forever and ever and ever. Revelation says it this way, he who is unjust, let him be unjust. 
He who is filthy, let him be filthy. To perish means to be cut off from God. The word means to be separated forever from the loving God. And the Bible says that when we receive God's love, we will never be separated from God's love. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you receive eternal life. And you don't get eternal life after you die. You get eternal life the moment you believe. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you receive eternal life. When does eternal life start for you? The moment you believe. And that means from the moment you believe all the way out into as far as you can imagine in eternity, you are not separated from God. You cannot be separated from him. Some people ask me, do I believe in eternal security? And I try not to argue with them. I just know what I know. And what I know is the Bible says when you accept Jesus Christ, you get eternal life. And there aren't any cul-de-sacs on that life. There aren't any conditions on that life. There's no ifs on that life. Eternal means eternal. It means it cannot ever end. Listen to Romans 8. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. What part of this don't we get? John says it, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When you become a Christian, when you truly put your trust in Jesus Christ, you are given the gift of eternal life. And some of you say, well, I know somebody who who they said they were saved and now they're they're not living. You know what? That's not my problem. And really, friend, it's not yours either. All I know is what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says, when I put my trust in Christ, he gives me the gift of eternal life. And how many of you know God's not the kind of God who comes and takes his gift back? God is a God who always keeps his promise. And when he gives you the gift of eternal life, listen to this again. And I give unto them, and they shall never perish. The exclusion of God's love can never perish if you have accepted God's love. And finally, and the best part is saved to last, number seven, the perfect number, God's love is eternal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Some of you know that I have amused myself in my adult life by collecting things that people write on their tombstones. I know that's sick, but I do it anyway. (laughs) And uh, one of my favorites is written on a tombstone in, of all places, Tombstone, Arizona. It's an epitaph for a man whose name was Les Moore. I don't think his friends really were mourning his death because this is how the epitaph reads. Here lies Les Moore, no less, no more. (laughs) And I got to tell you, that might be true for less more, but it's not true for those who know Jesus Christ. When we die, we will be more alive than we have ever been. John 3, 16 says, when we believe, we have eternal life as our present possession. Eternal life begins now. John 3, 16 begins with the God who has no beginning, and it ends with a life that has no ending. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. In his autobiography, author Arthur Miller tells of his marriage to Marilyn Monroe. During the filming of The Misfits, Miller watched Marilyn descend into the depths of depression and despair. He was fearing for her life as he watched their growing estrangement, her paranoia, and her continued dependence on barbiturates. One evening after a doctor had been persuaded to give Marilyn Monroe yet another shot, and she was sleeping, according to Miller in his book, Time Bends, Marilyn was lying in bed under the influence of the last shot she had been given. 
And Miller said, I found myself straining to imagine miracles. What if she were to wake and I were able to say to her, Marilyn, God loves you, darling. And she were able to believe it. And then he said this, how I wished I still had my religion and she had hers. What a telling moment in the life of a famous person. This is the message of this series of messages. God loves you, he always has, and he always will. What we do with that love is all important. God does not force it on us. In fact, I don't know that you can force love on someone. But I want to tell you what the Bible tells us today as clearly as I can. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you've done, whatever your background, whatever situation you're in, with authority on the basis of the Word of God, I am telling you today, God loves you. He always has loved you. He always will love you. What you do with that love is up to you. But you will never be able to stand before a holy God and say, why don't you let me into my heaven? Why don't you let me into your heaven? For God has made it possible for you to go. All you have to do is accept his love gift in Jesus Christ. We've been hearing a lot lately about the Titanic, the greatest ship of its time. A lot of movies and documentaries and books have been written on the sinking of the Titanic and some of them on people who were aboard the Titanic, like John Jacob Astor IV or the unsinkable Molly Brown. Yet one of the stories of the Titanic that most people don't know is one I want to tell you right now. It's the story of an heroic pastor who boarded the Titanic with his six-year-old daughter and had the privilege of preaching at one of the greatest moments of tragedy in history. He was on his way to America, to the Moody Church in Chicago, named for its famous founder, Dwight L. Moody. He was not only going to preach in that church, but he was there to assume the pulpit of that church. He was to be their next pastor. When the Titanic hit the iceberg, Harper successfully led his daughter to a lifeboat. And because he was a widower, he could have gotten on the lifeboat too. But instead, he put her on the lifeboat and he determined to stay and try the best he could to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many people as he could. Harper ran from person to person, passionately telling others about Christ. As the water began to submerge the unsinkable ship, Harper was heard shouting, women, children, and the unsaved get into the lifeboats. Rebuffed by a certain man at the offer of salvation, Harper gave him his own life jacket. He said, if you're not going to receive Jesus Christ, you better put this on because you need it more than I do. Up until the last moment on the ship, Harper pleaded with people to give their lives to Jesus Christ. The ship disappeared beneath the deep, frigid waters, leaving hundreds floundering in its wake with no realistic chance for rescue. Harper struggled through hyperthermia to swim to as many people as he could, still sharing the gospel. He would lose his battle with hypothermia, but not before giving many people one last chance to receive Christ before they died. Four years after the tragedy at a Titanic survivor meeting in Ontario, Canada, one survivor recounted his interaction with Harper in the middle of the icy waters of the Atlantic. He said he was clinging to ship debris when Harper swam up to him twice, challenging him with a biblical invitation to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. He rejected the offer once, yet given the second chance and with miles of water beneath his feet, the man finally gave his life to Christ. And then as Harper succumbed to his watery grave, this new believer was rescued by a returning lifeboat. As he concluded his remarks at the survivors meeting, he simply stated, I am the last convert of John Harper. <laughs> when the Titanic set sail, there were three classes of passengers. Yet immediately after the tragedy, the White Star Line in Liverpool, England, placed a board outside its office with only two classes of passengers. One side of the board said, known to be saved, and the other said, known to be lost. The owners of the Titanic had simply reaffirmed what John Harper already knew. 
There are people who know Christ and will spend eternity with God, known to be saved. And there are people who have rejected that opportunity and they are known to be lost. And I wanna ask you today, which list are you on? Because everyone here is on one list or the other. Either you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior and you're known to be saved and one day you'll spend eternity with the Almighty. And if you have not accepted it, maybe you have not ever had an opportunity to accept it, maybe you've never even heard the gospel until today, that's possible in this post-Christian world. But maybe you've heard it over and over again and you've just never ever done anything with it. Maybe you think that somehow God's love is gonna penetrate your life whether you do anything or not. I'm here to tell you, God loves you. He always has and he always will, but you cannot have his love unless you receive it. And when you receive his love by receiving his son, Jesus Christ, you become a possessor of eternal life and your name is put on the list. Known to be saved. Known to be saved. Which list are you on? Nothing is as profound as the Word of God. And now, Dr. Jeremiah has a Bible for every member of the family. There are numerous versions of the Jeremiah Study Bible, perfect for adults and teens. And the Airship Genesis Kids Study Bible will bring the truth of God's Word to the young ones in your life. For more information or to order, go to davidjeremiah.org Bible. 